Hi, sweetie. Hi, everyone. And thanks for joining us today for ACAT, um, our first ACAT of the year. I'd like, like to begin by acknowledging the, the custodians of the land on which I live and work, the Wajak Noongar peoples. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional lands, the digital platform reaches and extend this acknowledgement to First Nations people with us today and elders past and present. So today we have Brett Nichols presenting on his research on the Australian League of Rights, Foundations and Transformations of the Illiberal Imagination. I won't read his whole abstract because we're a small group today, so I think we should be very energetic. All good. <laughs> and so, so Brett, who a few of us know from Murdoch days, um, is a member of the Department of Film, Media, Film and Communication at the University of Otago, New Zealand. His research focuses on media politics, critical theory and discourse analysis. He recently published a co-edited volume with Springer titled Post-Truth and the mediation of reality. He's also an editor of Borderlands, Culture, Politics, Law and Earth, and the new journal, Baudrillard Now. So welcome to Curtin, Thank you. Brett. Thanks, uh, Great thanks for organising, uh, Kate. I'm um, at least coming out um, on the day before uh, Easter starts, which is good. I'm going to basically just talk about what I've been doing over the last few months in research that I'm doing on an organisation called the Australian League of Rights, who are a very active and prominent organisation in Australian politics, beginning around um, the 1930s. Um, they grew out of the um, they grew out of the uh, the social credit movement. Um, they grew out. 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 This is not going forward, falling. They grew out. They grew it. 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 My phone's just a few. Yeah. Nothing seems to be working. Oh, here we go. They grew it. They grew it. They grew it. There it is. So, um, Australian League of Rights. Um, I, I, I would describe them as a sort of a British Christian nationalist uh, group um, operating in the Australian context. Uh, I became really drawn to their ideas in some ways. I'd always kind of drawn to the ideas because my father was a member of the League of Rights. So I've actually been and heard um, Eric Butler, the main kind of... Um, speaker and the writer, the kind of brains behind the outfit, uh, if you will. Um, I've, I've heard him speak and met quite a few of uh, my father's um, friends, even until recently, to talk about some of the things to do with the, uh, with the, with the organisation. But as an organisation themselves, the, the Australian League of Rights begins in the 1960 and continues into the present, but it really sort of peaked around the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, it peaked so much that it was discussed in the Australian Parliament. There's a number of Hansard records, uh, which I have. Um, there are all sorts of ac accusations flying around the uh, the federal parliament about who had spoken at the League of Rights event. So Alexander, for example, um, presented at the League of Rights and still has his presentation up actually on their website, which I'm sure the Liberal Party is not very happy about. The country party, as they were in Queensland, um, with Ian Sinclair and a few others were really kind of involved in League of Rights um, and they had a number of um, front organisations inside of which they operate. So what I want to do today is talk about the League of Rights, their ideas, how I, how I, how how I came it. to be in this research. And of course, when, when I'm researching a historical organisation that begins in the 1930s through the social credit movement of C.H. Douglas, you always kind of thinking to yourself, okay, how do I, where's the kind of connection to today? Who's going to be interested in this stuff? And of course, during the voice um, um, referendum in the lead up to that of no campaign, I think this is heavily leaning upon what are basically uh, League of Rights, Australian League of Rights ideas. So here's a direct link to this with uh, the Red Over Black by uh, Jeff McDonald, 
Um, and of course, Arnus Lux, who's the, um, the president or the leader at the moment of the Australian League of Rights in South Australia, said that during the voice campaign, there these two books, Red Over Black and The Evidence, became among their top bestsellers. And of course, you know, this idea turns up in the popular imagination through Pauline Hanson's party, as well as Patrick Credlin, who's actually peddling the kind of ideas, which were League of Rights ideas. Even on the fringes as well, uh, we see uh, Australia One um, promoting this particular video. This is, this is Jeff McDonald um, promote, promoting the kind of ideas within uh, the Red Over Black, uh, the particular book about uh, land rights in the 1980s, in 1982. Um, and uh, Albanese naming the, uh, the Jewish power brokers that are actually behind uh, what's happening now is you'll gather you don't know anything about the league of rights they are a anti-semitic conspiracy theory organization that draw upon ch douglas's social credit ideas that come out of uh, britain i'll talk about that a little bit more um, as we go along the quadrant of course directly cited the text um, which is a league of rights text as i suggested here uh, we should be mindful um rights, uh, wind shuttle and battle, um, that Aboriginal activism had its genesis in the Communist Party as revealed in Jeff McDonald's Red Over Black and the Evidence. So there's a direct link to um, the ideas set out by Jeff McDonald in this particular text. Um, the, uh, the Spectator were peddling similar kinds of ideas about the Communist infiltration um, and they all come from this sort of, this, this his argument. One of the things I was really kind of interested in is why is the signifier communism still so prominent today? So in some ways, my own investigation is trying to dig back into that particular signifier, which I, I call it, a, I think of it as an empty signifier in some ways because of the way that it functions in the discursive setup of the um, of the League of Rights. But, but uh, Jeff McDonald's basic argument is that Aboriginal uh, peoples have been infiltrated infiltrated by communist um, agitators and so how they read any kind of um, land rights or uh, any kind of rights activity at all they don't, they don't see that as being generated by the people that uh, may be well are in actual in actual fact um, you know present you know, making you know making claims on the basis of their demands for wrongs and so on. They see this as an infiltration from uh, from the communist uh, um, infiltrate. They see it from from communists, and so, and so what they do is is that they make the argument, which is an argument. This is the argument that um, Jeff McDonald was making. They make the argument that he or he makes the argument that the problem with this is is that it is, is that it impacts upon Australia's sovereignty, because the idea of land rights is is understood as framed by MacDonald in Red Over Black is, is that you create a sovereign nation within a nation and you can't have two sovereign nations under the kind of British constitution. That's the kind of idea that they're peddling high, uh, that, they're, that, that, that they're peddling. And the same idea came out in the, the No uh, campaign in the, um, in the Voice uh, referendum uh, just recently. So here's, here's, my, here's my direct line to uh, this particular organisation. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Let's look at the organisation itself. They're a British Christian nationalist organisation and they have strange ideas about Christianity and what that is. They kind of see it in a very metaphysical kind of way. They have very strange ideas about the British constitution and the monarchy and the idea that the monarchy is a God-given, God-ordained. Um, in fact, they even try, they even... Yeah, even um, I even try to draw a line between Problem. the um, the throne, or we now King Charles's throne, and um, King da Biblical kind of King David. So they dip their toes into things like British Israelism, those kinds of arguments, which makes them really kind of um, um, I think you know a very interesting kind of conservative organisation, and. One of the reasons why I make a plug for this kind of research is, is that there's not enough research that actually tries to tries to demonstrate the 
dark side of conservative thinking. Right? There's not enough of this. There's a lot where we where we look at sort of really extremist kind of work that's around. But this there's this sort of sinister dark side to conservative thinking. And so this is why research on something like the League of Rights is actually is, is able to to demonstrate that. I think and that's hopefully what I'm going to try to demonstrate in that in my in what I'm doing. Now, um, the main driver of or the main sort of brains behind the League of Rights organisation is this guy Eric Butler. He's prolific in the amount of materials that he actually uh, has written. He has a number of books. Key sort of texts is a commentary called the International Jew on the on the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, that famous fake text that still does the rounds. Still buy it from the Australian League of Rights uh, website. Um, he also, and he also a kind of, um, we could call him a sort of a hardcore fundamentalist C.H. Douglas social creditor. So he thinks that, that C.H. Douglas, not only does he have a sort of fairly weird um, economic theory um, around how he understands money, um, but he has a sort of weird idea about, built into the idea of social credit is, is a social philosophy. So the idea that what C.H. Douglas did was he stumbled across, he stumbled upon a truth, the truth of social credit. This is the ordained, sort of like a metaphysical law of the universe. And this is the way that the world should be in terms of social credit. And basically what social credit means, what it means not just, it's not just about money, it's also about a social, a set of social relations. In fact, C.A. Douglas's ideas themselves are sort of strange mixture of a range of different things. So you have a little bit of kind of Marxist critique of capitalism in there. You have some anarchism. You have some um, you have some libertarian sort of ideas that are floating through. It's a strange kind of ten, you know, a synthesis of all of these kinds of ideas, which is which is kind of interesting when you try to untangle those. But C.H. Douglas's idea is that the social world or that the, the wealth that we all have, our social lives, things that we can actually do, is generated through sets of cooperative relationships. People work together, they build things. This is, this is kind of an anarchist idea that's built into this sort of notion. But then they argue, then C.H. Douglas argues that what should happen is, is that we need to understand that that develops over time. Technologies develop. Systems of production become a lot more efficient. So therefore, if we follow that, then that means that the, 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 the generations that inherit those particular ideas, they don't really need to work that much anymore because we've built productive, we have these productive systems that actually build things, produce wealth, that are very efficient in terms of the production, that everybody's needs are actually met, their means of subsistence and all those things are actually met. So we don't even really need to work, is the arguments that uh, people like C.H. Douglas make and then Eric Butler after him. Now, what Butler does with that idea is, is he argues that this is a kind of metaphysical truth and that all political systems need to um, line up with that metaphysical uh, kind of truth and that all of his publications make these kinds of claims. Now, along the way with Eric Butler, what you find is, is that, well, actually, what happens with C.H. Douglas is that C.H. Douglas thinks he's found this truth. And of course, you know, he goes along and talks to Keynes and a few other people. And they say, you know what, mate, you're actually a bit of a crackpot. You know, your, your monetary theory wouldn't actually work for a range of different reasons. Um, we'll leave that to one side. And so what... C.H. Douglas does is each he, he, he tries to find a reason for that happening. Why why are they kind of rejecting my ideas? And so this is where it very quickly tips over into an anti-Semitism, where the idea is the problem is is that the financiers, the global um, global conspiracy, the the Jewish bankers are actually stopping all of this from happening. So any kind of resistance is understood in those particular terms. You'll note that there's a very kind of oversimplification of things and how they work, as as we'll see. So Butler spent his sort of whole life peddling this idea, and so along the way, he sets up uh, the Australian League of Rights, probably out of that social credit kind of movement. 
the the social credit movement that he was a part of would uh, published uh, this uh, the New Times um, in the um, in the nineteen in the nineteen thirties. So uh, they, this this was a publication that would have been on the streets of Melbourne, sometimes daily, weekly. Sold um, as people going to the train station, so a regular kind of uh, newspaper publication um, as as we go along. Um, so the league's established in 1946 um, in Victoria to begin with, and then South Australia, Queensland, West Australia in 1951, and then they combined to make the League of Rights in 1960. Then spanned out to Canada 1964, Britain 1967. And then into New Zealand in 1970, and then they established a Commonwealth League of Rights in 1972. Although I don't think, I don't think they actually, um, I don't think they actually did that much. Problem, 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 problem. There you go. So you can see the screen. Um, yeah. So I don't think they actually uh, did that much. Um, they did a few conventions and things, and that's about it. Um, You'll find too that when you do study, when I when I've gone into the archive, you find that what happens is is that the the league has a sort of real kind of state character. So there's a lot happening in Queensland. Uh, there's a lot happening in um, problem problem problem. To, let's just minimise that. Good. There's a lot happening in uh, Queensland, and there's a lot happening in uh, Victoria as well. Is what's interesting is is that the researchers that focus on this um, tend to focus on those kinds of regions. Now, one of the things that's staggering about studying an organisation like this is just how prolific they are in terms of the material that they have produced. It is a staggering amount of material. Thousands and thousands and thousands of newsletters and documents, books and so on, they really are prolific. So they've been publishing uh, a weekly newsletter since 1960 um, on Target, and that still comes out every week. So there are thousands of these things. There's uh, the second journal was called Ladies Line, um, which was in Queensland. I got the opportunity to read some uh, Ladies Line in, uh, in Queensland, which was good. And then... The, they have the New Times, the New Times Survey, which begins in 1935. That is actually still going, although less publications. They do other things like Bank Watch, and there's a Heritage um, magazine that they that they that they publish, but it's very hard to know. Uh, it's very hard to know where that begins and ends. It's just sort of material that you come across. I'm not sure about that very much. Now, here's an example of um, a typical. Uh, here's a uh, typical example of the league kind of material here. So you have ladies' line, um, and they love quoting um, the Communist Manifesto. They love quoting this text. And in fact, there's the uh, the ten points of how to you know create a communist state. Is all it's often peddled by uh, the right. Um, those those ten um, kind of points that uh, Marx and Engels make in that text. They 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 talk about in ladies' line the abolition of the family the bourgeois family will vanish at the, the, the communist manifesto. Uh, you look at that. Why well, you going? It is in the communist manifesto, of course. But you know they love to cherry pick with their quotes, which is how they, which is what they kind of do. They cherry pick and they don't look at the text around it. Yes, that's right. So of course Marx and Engels wanted to abolish the bourgeois family because they're trying to abolish the bourgeoisie, right? Yeah, they're trying to. And produce a, a classless society. So obviously you're not going to have the bourgeois family, are you? Anyway, and the second thing you'll notice is that in defence of Christian heritage um, is key to how they actually operate. Now, along with now this, the, the organisation itself works through Eric Butler at the head, then he would appoint a number of, numbers of state directors and then they have a number of front organisations they operate through. And the reason they had these front organisations, particularly in the 70s and 80s and onwards, is that their anti-Semitism became very prominent in the Australian press and a few different studies that have happened. Also the Australian Parliament as well. So, you know, they became the, the anti-Semitic guys, which is all true. So they produce or created these front organisations, and here are some of them. So you have Australian Heritage Society, Institute of Economic Democracy, Conservative Speakers Clubs, there's Christian Institute for Individual Freedom, 
a lot of fun actually reading uh, their material. Um, and then they have things called policy associations. So at the bottom of this organizational hierarchy, they have um, voters policy organizations, VPAs, and those VPAs consist of four to six people. That's all they are. And basically what they do is they take the materials that they receive from on target and then they do things like write to their local politician, uh, put um, put uh, advertising in local newspapers, try to infiltrate local councils, uh, local parliament, uh, state parliaments, and so on. So the voter policy organisations are these loose affiliates, and there were thousands of these. In fact, um, um, somebody had actually tried to list how many they had in each state and where they were kind of located, but they had lots of these. Vol uh, voter uh, voters policy association. So on the surface, it looks like what it is through those institutes and those VPAs. It looks like it's a sort of grassroots sort of democratic organisation. You know, mobilising people on the street to get involved in you know politics, local, state, to the federal level. You know, in some senses, it is that, but in another sense, it's actually not that at all because. Basically, what those organisations do is they peddle the League of Rights ideas. They peddle the League of Rights metaphysic. This is how the economy should be. So it's not democratic. It's, it's saying, you need to be like this. Why aren't you like this? Why are you giving in to the communists? That's what they actually do. So it's not a kind of democratic, it's a liberal democracy where you might have a group of different people together and the outcomes of that discussion, whether it's through consensus or some kind of form of um, decision-making, actually produces a result that nobody really has any control of. That's not how they see it. So they're, they're, they're not really a democratic organisation. They are more about peddling um, the, uh, the social credit ideas. Along with these front organisations, they also do things like um, um, along with um, publishing those and having front organisations, you know, they also had things like um, social credit schools um, and lots of um, lots of town hall sort of speaking, going going through uh, towns and cities and advertising, you know, their talks and so on, debates with local politicians and things like that. So I've tried to paint here is a very a picture of a prolific amount of material that any researcher is kind of is a daunting kind of task to actually look at all of that material to try to cut through it um, is actually a really difficult um, kind of job um, which is what I've been trying to do in some ways but what I found was I was really along uh, along with a few newspaper articles because there are a few um, expose pieces uh, Melbourne Age ran one uh, in the 1970s, a four-part uh, expose on the legal rights and how anti-Semitic and, and so on they are. Um, apart from apart from those, there's very 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 little scholarly work. So you have Keith Richmond's materials, and he he basically just has some collected papers that are sitting in the uh, in the archive in uh, University of New England, which I was looking at last week actually. Um, you know, really interesting kind of empirical study of the League of Rights in that particular context um, and posing a number of questions. So a lot of these researchers, what they try to do is think about how, how do we how do we categorise the League of Rights? How do we, where do we situate them? Are they a conservative organisation? How do they line up with fascism? Um, where do they sit in relation to things like uh, libertarian economics and stuff like that? So that's really the sort of questions that they that they ask. And so Keith Richmond does very it's, does this empirical research trying to map how the organisation front work within the kind of University of New England area. Andrew Campbell is probably uh, his 1978 book is probably the the book length scholarly study on the League of Rights. Um, and what he does is look at them as an organisation. A little bit in there about their ideas mostly about them as an organisation and how they function. And then you have Paul Spoonley in the New Zealand context writing specifically about the New Zealand League of Rights in Politics of Nostalgia. But this is a, this is a sort of chapter within a broader uh, kind of text. And he's, in the New Zealand context, he's the guy to go to if you want to talk about the uh, 
the League of Rights. But of course, the last sort of piece has been written in 1987. There are a few other bits and pieces around, but these are it. Um, there, there's also K.D. Gott's uh, Voices of Hate, uh, which is a well-known text um, that is the study of Eric Butler demonstrating his anti-Semitism and so on. It's a kind of an interesting sort of study. Keith Richmond didn't like this book very much, by the way. Um, he thinks that it's too uh, too reductionist. And so you get some interesting sort of tensions between these particular thinkers around these questions of how you might categorise uh, these, these, these this, this organisation. Where do they sit? And, and, and in some ways, you have Keith Richmond and Andrew Campbell are doing a kind of... Um, I don't know, a sort of a positivist uh, sociology, I suppose you might describe it off. So Keith Richmond's approach is to say, so here's fascism, here's the central tenets of uh, the League of Rights. Okay, do they match up? They meet, they meet here, they don't meet here. So therefore, they're not really anti-Semitic. It's something else that's going on, is what he argues. It's this kind of, uh, I, I think of it as sort of a positivist um, social science in some ways. Spoonley's is kind of a, a Marxian um, approach where he tries to think about what motivates people to join an organisation like the League of Rights. And he thinks about things, this is a sort of petty bourgeois expression of discontent. Uh, Richmond um, taps into that kind of reason, that, that kind of um, approach as well. Like why would people, you know, join? And he notices that they tend to really kind of take a hold, particularly in the 1970s, around stagflation at that particular time. They came in with all their arguments about inflation and so on, and about, way the, about the way the money should work. And so what you get is, um, so what you end up with is, I don't know, sort of this, a descriptive sociology in some ways. I'm not really satisfied with that approach. I do think they, they, they make some very clear and very good insights into, into what's actually going on in this organisation, for sure. Um, and we don't want to minimise the sort of contribution that's actually been made. But my own approach is actually uh, discourse analysis. And I'm kind of interested in the uh, logics approach of Linus and Howard and how they build on Leclerc and Ruth's um, discourse, um, approach to discourse. And I'm really interested in the things that don't get taken up in the kind of more sort of positive sociological uh, Accounts, which are things like, okay, there's a lot of repetitions that go on in the League of Rights. Why do they repeat the same things over and over again all the time? We need to have an answer to that because it's not, it's not about, it's not like, you know, it's an organisation that's carefully sat down and thought about its ideas and said, okay, here's the truth of the sort of situation. It's more a kind of compulsion in some ways. So I'm interested in the logics approach because it allows us to think about that. For example, it allows us to think about things like phantasmatic um, formations of what I would call phantasmatic logics. It's sort of a series of fantasies that are in play here about how they might imagine themselves. Also interested in the concept of reaction formations. Um, so kind of psychoanalytic kind of idea, I guess. But, you know, the idea that it actually, that for them to be able to constitute their identity and their understanding of themselves, they need to have an enemy over there. So I'm interested in how those kinds of lines and those structures are actually drawn up. And to do that, so I've been looking at uh, pamphlets, books, recordings, newsletters, advertising, conversations with former members, newspaper magazine articles on the lead, scholarly works, well, those few scholarly works that there are around and so on. And there's a massive amount of material um, I don't use, I use a database for a lot of the, uh, uh, the legal rights material, but I don't, I'm not interested in generating statistics because it's quite easy to see that over time that, that the signifier communism is repeated over and over and over and over and over and over again. So the question becomes, okay, we have these instances, the question then becomes, well, why do they keep repeating this particular idea? Well, they keep repeating this idea because it has something to do with their identity, how they understand themselves as um, Christian nationalists. Uh, they need to have that kind of enemy. They need to have that other against which they against which they define themselves. That's what I'm really interested in. So if you follow the, the, uh, the discourse approach, you have to think about 
uh, uh, it's a problematics, right? What are the, what's the problem that they're trying to deal with here? How do they, what are they trying to do here? Well, in some ways it's built around this uh, beatific fantasy, this idea that there is this British heritage that is pure, that has the promise of fullness. If only, if only we set up our social institutions and our government and so on to actually operate in terms of that particular idea, then everything will actually be all right. So the whole, the whole, um, what characterizes all of their work is how do they maintain a society that's faithful to that protecting British heritage. Now it's, yeah, that's interesting. I think this idea of British heritage. I mean, I was only recently watching an interview with John Howard, and he basically repeats what they say about British heritage of Australia, British common law. Um, we are so happy that we have a God ordained monarchy. We're very lucky here in Australia that we inherited, we have the heritage of um, British common law and that we've built our society around that. You know, this is, it, these, these ideas are actually quite current. And, and not only that, um, we recently saw the, uh, the ARC, the ARC, what is it? The Association for Responsible Citizenship. It's run by Jordan Peterson. Uh, John Anderson is one of the directors of that from used to be in the national party. Um, and then you have, uh, John Howard was there, um, Tony, uh, uh Tony, um, Tony Abbott was there all, you know, buying into the sort of conservative ideas about how things should actually be run. So what I'm trying to do is sort of just peel the lid off conservatism because what you even noticed in the, those conversations that are happening with ARC recently, last year it was, is this idea of the threat. The threat's looming large. This threat is hanging over us. Something is happening here. We need to defend against... Uh, well, it's not just moral decay, we're against political anarchy and so on. So the threat looms large. And so this repetition that I'm talking about is where the league really tries to probably spend an enormous amount of time constructing that, I mean, if we're using Laclaue and Luthien language, constructing that antagonistic frontier. They spend a lot of effort constructing that frontier, always constructing this frontier, always talking about communism and when you read their material you notice oh well you know they, they're even aware of the fact that they're always talking about communism because they write they, they write they do, they do a sort of a disavowal we don't always talk about communism you know but you know actually you do right so this this disavowal i think is really interesting so the central horrific fantasy is that they guard the guardians of eternal this is uh, jeremy lee who was one of the uh, lead kind of guys in that organization which we guard through thick and thin, carrying these truths through the fires of degeneracy and disbelief to the pool beyond. We are now not at the end, but at the beginning of one of the great crusades of history. I love the kind of um, apocalyptic kind of sense in which um, this sort of apocalyptic imagination turns up all the time. If we're seeing it now with the idea of this is, this is the most important election ever in the history of you know, so on. Like these, this is how the formulation actually works. Uh, this is Eric Butler himself. He must build a society based upon genuine Christian principles. As I say, he has this sort of weird idea about Christianity. Also comes with the policy of the very devil himself. Subordination of the individual is the devil. Well, collectivism um, in all its various forms. Um, so they're conservative defenders of freedom. And in their, their literature and ephemera, these ideas are actually repeated over and over again. So I actually quite really, I really like this. They want your land as uh, the cover of um, a book that, you know, the hand of the, of the centralizer in the kind of pristine kind of farmland there. However, uh, if you can't really see that, it's, it's pristine farmland. And then you have the centralizer, so taxation, municipal rates, increasing financial costs, rural indebtedness, probate are against the death taxes and so on because they, um, they believe in the idea of inheritance. Um, and then of course peddling the idea, I mean this this this, this one on the on the right here um, about Soviets housewives getting their uh, getting their beef about the price is sort of you know peddling this kind of idea that the Australian government is subsidizing the Soviet Union. This is why really the federal government 
has become a you know has become a communist uh, stronghold. I think it's kind of interesting. And of course, uh, I don't know, as I say, much ink is actually spread with this particular idea um, that the the path of world conquest. Um, and of course, what, you, uh, what this is where I think this term communism and communist in political discourse is really interesting because. It's tied up to the idea of um, as, as anti-Semitic sort of linkages, which I think is really interesting. But communist can become a shorthand term for international Jewish financiers, and in some ways, this is how it also functions in in the uh, the legal rights material. So sometimes when they're talking about communism, they're actually talking about Jewish financiers or these. These these different uh, these different categories that uh, collapse into each other uh, in some ways they become one. Um, so I think I think the term you know the communists you know you're a communist I think there, there, there's some linkage there there's some history there's some residue of these connections to the way the League of Rights used to construct this as um, in fact one of their other things that they have is Zach and all the rich people are communists. That's what I mean. Really, you know, come on. That's, that, that's a really interesting kind of idea. And so they, so they spend a lot of time and, you know, the tropes that they use to be able to talk about the communists, they're kind of very anti-Semitic in the way that they, the red filth that has penetrated American society. Um, racial strife as a communist weapon. Uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People is ridden with communist frontiers and subversives and is in fact a communist tool. Supreme Court's decision to de desegregate American schools was itself a pro-communist uh, manoeuvre. So there's this a kind of oversimplification of all of these quite legitimate you know, right struggles and so on. They have their own demands, they have their own uh, forms of organisation and so on. It's all kind of been infiltrated. This is a problem with it. They're not really in control of their destiny. So look, I'm running out of time. Now I want to, and I, I want to ask a question. So I'll, I'll just end with this point here, and say that in this mass of material, I I think everything hangs around these three nodal points. So in you know your discourse theory, the nodal points are these you know uh, these uh, where where uh, linkages and, and other signifiers gravitate around those larger kinds of points, right? So one has to do with, in my work, it's to do with heritage. Second has to do with Christian nationalism. So I'm picking and, un, and, and, and um, unpacking that. I think is actually an important task, uh, particularly considering um, the, the move of conservatism um, internationally and in the Australian context as well. And then, of course, the communist threat, the conspiracy theory. So it means that and sort of has this sort of rhetorical um, tool that anybody can use that's a member of the League of Rights to say that anybody who disagrees with our ideas coming in from the, the perspective of others. And actually, no, this will be my last point. The League's conspiratorial binary structure of thinking. So everything is works in this way. Christianity good, Judaism bad. I hear you asking, what about the Judeo-Christian ethic? They don't use that term because they think these two... The big struggle in the world for the League of Rights people is between Judaism and Christianity. Not between, it's not a class struggle in the, in the Marxian sense. It's between Judaism and Christianity. And so they even, you know, they twist themselves in all kinds of interesting, weird sort of ways of thinking to get around this idea. Not to use the term Judeo-Christian uh, heritage, which everybody else uses. They just use the term Christian heritage because they don't think that Jesus was a Jew. It's probably interesting. I argue that Mary was, she was as some Russian or something. Anyway, um, individuality versus collectivism always, although their form of individuality is deeply problematic in the sense that it really means that you have to acquiesce to, it's kind of Tantian idea of freedom and, and individuality. You know, you can do, you have to do this. Yeah, you've got a free choice to do that. If you don't, you know, there'll be all hell to, you know, there'll be all hell to pay. So it's not really a kind of a choice. You're, not, you're in charge of your own destiny. You can make the right choice or the wrong choice. That's it. So that's the kind of idea of individuality and freedom. Collectivism, of course, working together is wrong. 
decentralization. They kind of defend the Australian constitution and say that that's all about states rather than the federal government. Because if you read the constitution, it's not really about that. It's actually about the powers of the federal government in relation to the states. Small business versus the large corporation. This is sort of petty bourgeois elements. Small government is always good. Big government, bad. State government, good. Federal government, state government, local councils, good. Federal government, bad. So that logic of thinking turns up in all of the discussions that you have with uh, league people, but also in all their literature as well. It was working through that particular conspiratorial sort of binary. Okay. I think I'll stop there and have some questions because we're running out of time. Thanks.